Very well. Let's start from the top. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the fifth class of this Get Started in Open Seas with STKO. So today, as always, we're going to have 30 minutes of presentation, some questions, and there's our forum open for any questions that you'll have later on. Um, yes, so we are at our fifth class. Today, we talk about physical properties. As you know, this central chunk of our, let's say, course on Open Seas with STKO, it's more theoretical than practical. I have an example for you today, both in PICO and STKO. But we're just going to talk in theory, what are physical properties and how do we use them? Next week, we're going to talk about element properties. So without further ado, let's start. I'm going to divide the presentation in four parts. First, defining what is a physical properties? How does it work in reference with other for software? And how do you create one and assign one both in OpenSeas and STKO? And then we're going to just go a bit deeper down in some characteristic of specific materials, sections, and special purpose, which are, in fact, physical properties. I'm just going to talk about only the ones that are referenced to 3D frame structures. So there are much more, of course, material sections and, and material and sections in, in open seas than the ones that I'm going to show you today. You are feel free to, to explore them online. But for now, we're just going to focus on 3D frame structures. So I'm going to define the physical properties, tell you how they are different between STK and OpenSeas and between STK and OpenSeas and other softwares, define what it is that it's a neat subject. We already talked about this in the first, um, in our first class, but I'm going to repeat it, and how to create and assign them. Physical properties are constitutive models. So it's everything that describes your model behavior in terms of constitutive behavior. There were, these kind of relationships are at the heart of material nonlinearities modeling. And all that you find in OpenSeas, it's found in STKO. So all material section integration scheme assignments are in STKO as in OpenSeas. And they all provide a mathematical relationship that describes the material and the section behavior. Of course, the choice of these models depends on the structure that you are that you decide to model. For example, if I am in a 3D structure, I want to see all stress tensor components, or if I have fiber base elements, I would only want to see one stress tensor longitudinal component along the element. So the choice of the constitutive model is, let's say, part of your engineering judgment when you start to make a new model. In OpenSeas, you define materials by calling the command, for example, Uniax material, and defining the material characteristics. Of course, sometimes you will have to do some calculations before. And once you have defined the Uniaxon material, you will have to define a section. This is an example on how to define a fiber section. You need a lot of variables to set beforehand before you can create a fiber section with specific commands that we're going to see later on. In STKO, this is all done inside the model builder that constructs the objects of your model. Okay, so. These are, let's say, the, the little pieces of the puzzle that you put together in order to create your program that runs in OpenSeas and creates your model. Instead, in STKO, what you do is that you assign, define and assign the physical properties through the work tree or any way through the interface. And let's say we have to add a little bit of a piece because um, all physical properties are constitutive aspects of your model. So there's, there are also integration schemes which in OpenSeas are actually found inside the elements. So let's say to make a, a complete comparison between this script and my STKO model, I will have to add the element properties. And we're going to talk about this next week anyway. So what's the difference between OpenSeas and STKO with the, all the other softwares? So in STKO and OpenSeas, you don't have preloaded material properties. You have material constitutive behavior. So you cannot choose among regular materials that you find, for example, in construction or on the codes, there are no implementation of code and regulations calculations. So there's something that you have to add yourself. But you have complete control over such constitutive models. You can adjust them and, let's say, modify them at, at your will. You can define different integration schemes at each, for each geometry and different properties for different integration points. Um, you need to have, of course, a deeper understanding of them to to, let's say to implement all of this and but you can exploit the potential of programming capabilities of two 
uh, full programming languages, Tico and, and Python. So just, for example, to make an example of the comparison between SDK and OpenSys to go a bit deeper in what is it and it's a physical properties. So this is a concept, let's say, physical property that does not exist in OpenSys documentation. It's just something that we, uh, let's say, def defined as a group uh, to um, contain all of material and section elements, objects of OpenSys. For each material and section object in OpenSys, there is a physical property each object in SKO. It is written in Python and he has specific attributes and specific metadata. For example, here you can see that the common section elastic that you can use in OpenSys, just writing it in your SQL script, is the same as creating the physical property in the, in, in the work tree of your SDKO model and choosing from here model section, the section elastic. And it has exactly the same metadata as you find in, in the SQL script. For example, the section tag will be of course, the index that you will have in your work tree is the section tag that you apply to your section in, in your TICO. And then you will have your young modulus. Then you will have your array that in this case is calculated automatically by the beam section editor because you just introduce, let's say, two um, dimensions and then the beam section editor calculates your area. And overall, all the rest you see, if, uh, the inertia, uh, everything is given by uh, the same command that you find in OpenSys, you find in SDKO. So let's say just this parallelism for you to understand how things are implemented. And in the end, what, what really SDKO does is take this metadata and this information and write it in a typical file that will run in OpenSys. Nothing different than what you do um, while you just, when you just program your, your, your structure yourself. So, to go forward, if it goes forward, sorry, it doesn't move. Yes. Oh, what you can do in STKO is create, delayed, clone, edit existing physical property, assign them and unassign them in your model by dragging them on a selection or dragging and uh, pressing control while you drag them on a selection to unassign them. And of course, there is the color coding system that we talked about last time. And I just wanted to make a clarification because last time we talked about local access and geometric transformation. So there's a difference between what's a characteristic axis and what's a local axis, say in the terms that we want to use to describe this, this concept here. So a characteristic axis, for example, in this beam, as you see, is the X axis, which is the longitudinal axis of the beam. Each kind of geometry in, in STKO has a characteristic axis. This is true for every 3D modeling software. So the, um, the beam has the X axis, the face has the Z axis, which is the normal axis. And the 3D solid has also the normal axis of each of the face. So in this case, when, uh, when I talked to you about the reverse semi-equilibrium command that last week, that was to change the orientation of the characteristic axis. Instead, once you have defined your characteristic axis, but for example, let's go back. Uh, for example, if you by mistake had given the height a certain value, but that instead was your uh, base, or you want to define with the same section two elements that are inverted, one in compared with the other, you can use the local axis. So create a specific local axis system, local axis system, and apply it to a certain element. I will show you that later on uh, when we open STKO. But just for you to remember, characteristic axis and local axis are two different things. So characteristic axis is for, for a beam is the X axis, and the local axis are how the X and the Y and Y axis, let's say, organize around it, OK? So going forward, let's talk about materials. So there are so many materials in OpenSeas. One very basic concept that is really good to understand from the beginning in, is that uniaxial materials are objects in OpenSys that can represent any type of relationship. Let's say a uniaxial material is just a curve that you can use to represent different things. For example, for truss and fiber section, for truss elements and fiber section objects, the uniaxial materials represent stress and strain relationship. So uh, in the calculation inside OpenSys, stress and tangent are multiplied by 
the cross-section area of a truss or the fiber area to get the force, which is, some, for example, in the fiber section is summed over the section to get the section stress resultant. Okay, so in specific, uh, let's say, if you use a uniaxial material with truss and fiber section, then you are modeling stress and strain relationship. But if you, for example, use it with a section aggregator in a beam, you can model force deformation, force strain relationship. In this case, the open seas will not do an automatic integration of the model response, but you will have to calculate your response by hand if you're doing your own statistical script or open, like um, STKO will calculate the result for you. Instead, for example, in zero length elements, which are collapsed elements and are used often to model springs, you also you, you don't have automatic integration of the model response, but you can model force displacement or moment rotation relationship in that point. It's, a, let's say, an interesting read to read the Professor Scott blog post about uniaxial materials, which kind of explains this concept a bit further and allows you to understand that this is actually a multi-purpose tool, the uniaxial material that you can use at will to model whatever kind of relationship that you want. The most used, let's say basic, not used, but the basic, the most basic in the material is the elastic one, which actually models a linear behavior. So for every material, as I said, we have the interface in STKO and which are the parameters that you have to enter in TICO to create them. It is possible to use um, the section elastic command directly on elastic beam column element. For example, if you want to assign specific stiffness parameters, Mm, if you have an inch beam and you're trying to model concentrated plasticity and you want to uh, assign an infinite stiffness to the end of one of the uh, to one end of the beam, then you can use uh, the elastic material to model that just that specific stiffness only. Another type of material that is very much used is, of course, are the materials to model concrete. So we have concrete zero one, concrete zero two, and steel zero two for the reinforcement. So concrete zero one and zero two, the difference is that in concrete zero one, you only, you don't have any strength intention. Instead in concrete zero two, you can uh, model a, um, a linear softening behavior intention, uh, apart from the linear unloading and reloading in compression has this one, unloading and reloading. So these are example parameters that you can use to, to make exercises with these materials. Of course, the unit system, I, I made a few changes for you to see how I change if you want to define different parameters. And of course, you can use the material tester, but we'll talk about it a bit later. Then we have steel for reinforcement that models isotropic hardening, isotropic strain hardening. And lastly, uh, of course, this is a kind of material that you can use cyclically. And lastly, we, can, we have a material that we can use to model masonry behavior. So this is, let's say, um, a material that, that you can use to model a pinch load deformation response. I, we didn't include here the parameters to, to, um, to model the degradation and under cyclic loading. And you can see it here when we play the, when we make the tests for cyclic loading, we don't have a degradation, but there's a lot of, um, uh, documentation on this material. And this is for an example of something that you can use if you're doing, for example, equivalent frame modeling to model the behavior of your masonry. So just to show you how I created all of those curves for each of these materials, uh, all the next material have this tool, the material tester. You just go inside and you pick the type of test that you want to run on your material. Um, we have, for example, monotonic and static symmetric linear increasing, which are the one that you commonly use on basic elements. The one referenced in this code is specifically for concrete. Uh, after you've defined all of your um, parameters, like target strain, divisions, and cycles, etc., when you change this, the, the, the type of ramp that you're using on your test will change. So you will see what is it that you're actually applying to your to your material. And then at the end, you can actually click on the data button and copy paste your material test somewhere else. Just remember if you close uh, the physical property editor, your test will be lost. So if you took you a long time to get to a certain point, uh, to get to a certain curve, just save it because otherwise it will not be kept inside of the physical properties editor. 
So after materials, we have sections. Just to make a step back, in OpenSea's and FTKU, you cannot take a material and apply it to an element in your geometry. That's because uh, it will not know how to, it will not know which section to refer to. So you need to have both material and sections. And, and once again, the, the basic material that we have, uh, the basic sections that we have is the elastic section, as I showed you at the beginning. Um, the elastic section is the only place in STQ where you will find some a unit system in the definition here. And this is because the internal database, our internal database is written in millimeters and we need a scale factor to make some calculations. But of course, this does not depend on the rest of your model. So you need to be consistent. But if you change the unit here, it will change for the specific elements. Another section that is really, really um, used in OpenSea is the fiber section. So um, mostly to model um, uh, concrete structure, but also masonry, et cetera. A fiber section has a generic geometric configuration that is formed by all different subregions and regular shapes. They can be quadrilateral in this example, or also circular or triangular, and they're called patches. In each, in each section, you can have both patches and layers, layers of reinforcement in this case, which are uh, singular fibers and not face fibers like these ones. Uh, this is the command to build a fiber section in OpenSeas. Uh, of course, there's a missing, let's put it here for the sake of, yes, there was a missing, parentheses at the end. So when you build a fiber section, you need to call all of these three commands. Um, you have the locations of functional fibers. Then you have the construction of the patch. You give the extremes of the patch, the number of subdivisions in both directions. And then you have a layer, for, for example, for reinforcements. Um, in this case, you, you have to define the position of the first and the last element of the layer and the number of fibers in, in the layer. The same commands are, of course, in STQO, but it's much, much easier. We have two ways that you can build a fiber section in STQO. There is the fiber section editor, which is used for generic fiber sections. For example, here we have this steel profile. And of course, we couldn't have made a custom, let's say, a, um, a uh, custom-made tool for each of the possible profiles that we have are out there. But we have one for rectangular fiber sections for concrete structures. And this one has an automated building uh, built-in tool. You can see here that you can define um, a fiber material for the core, for the cover, and for the rebars. If you do not choose the core material, the automated um, the automatism inside of STKO will calculate for you the value of the materials properties for the reinforced concrete inside, for the confined concrete inside of your core. So let's say the same way that uh, we built the open seas, we, we saw the open seas command here that builds the patch and the layer, et cetera, et cetera. Here you have the same, but you can just visualize your result right away. And then the last section that I'm gonna talk to you about is the aggregator. So the aggregator groups previously defined uniaxial material objects into a single section. In a force deformation model that you can apply to your elements. Um, well, taking a step back, you cannot really apply an aggregator, but I'm gonna tell you a little later. What you can do with an aggregator is, for example, if you have um, another section and you um, reference this section, for example, an elastic section, with this tag, but then you want to apply a different kind of behavior of your geometry, uh, of your element in a different direction, for example, in shear, you can create a new material, of course, just for shear, and then references it into this container. So when you click on this, uh, a material tag metadata will appear and you, can, you will be able to choose your material from the drop-down menu. This is done so that you can apply to the same section two different material properties, because in, in OpenSeas, this is something that is possible to choose this two, one, more than one material properties for the same element. In STQO, that's not possible. So going forward, we have, lastly, the special purpose elements. As I was saying before, um, oh yeah, just to point out 
not all of these elements, not all of these special purpose X objects are in open as, as you can see them written here. So most of the physical properties that you will find in our editor are exactly the same as the one in OpenSys. But some of them are new, something that we introduced. Some things are uh, automatism that we created or specific uh, construct that we needed to make OpenSys run in STKO, uh, to, to make STKO print out the right um, programs to run in OpenSys. So as I was saying in OpenSys, there is, not the, uh, there is the option of assigning more than one physical property to the same element. This in STKO cannot be done, but this is also something that happens in a lot of other uh, FAM software because yeah, uh, it doesn't really make uh, it's a straightforward sense. It's much easier if you have one single thing that is applied to each element so that you can identify it clearly. The special purpose function, which is the, our, the last chapter of our class, it's a container for more than one physical properties. So you can just put them all and then this one is actually applied to the element. Maybe we, shan, we should show you like this. Yes, this kind of makes more sense. So let's say the, the ba most basic example of a special purpose is the beam section property. So with the beam section property, uh, in this case, in the one that I'm showing you now, you're just choosing the most used integration scheme and selecting the section um, to reference and apply to your element. But for example, if you want to, to choose another integration scheme that kind of allows you to apply different um, different material to different integration points of your section, you will be able to use the special purpose uh, beam section properties as a container of all of these materials. So to define it, the beam section property contains one or more uniaxial material, depending on the chosen integration scheme that you want to use. Then we have other type of these special purpose containers, like the zero length material that contains also one or more uniaxial material, or the truss that contains the, the truss element and also the section object. So there's another type of special purpose too, which is an automatism that is created in STKO to operate the assembly of existing OpenSys objects without you having to code them by hand in TCO or draw them in STKO. For example, the, the most one, oh, here there's a, also here there's a missing thing. So for example, the basic one, it's the RC joint model in 3D. I don't know if any one of you has ever tried to apply a sister model in OpenSys to a joint in a framed concrete structure. Uh, that's a bit complicated because you have to draw the node and then you have to draw offsets of the node. And from the offset, you have to make your element start and, all of, and create rigid links between these, uh, let's say three slave nodes and your master node at the center of your um, of your joint, that's a bit complicated to do by hand, even if you have a GUI like OpenSys, like STKO. So in this case, we created an automatism that creates the rigid link and the beam column to model the constitutive behavior of the joint just by applying it to the node. We will see this in our last uh, classes, the one that are made of, that are just more practical. And just to end, I'm gonna give you an example of let's say a full model with all the physical property applied and also a running one. Uh, last week, I, I just showed you how to create the parallelism between creating the geometry in OpenSys and STKO of the same 3D frame structure, but I have made a full one, yes, uh, in which we can also compare the result. So we are here, I moved my model from this point to another point. Uh, I will show you later on why. Compared to last week's model, I just added the master nodes to create the rigid diaphragm, as in the large model overview that I gave you of, of the large frame structure, the one of whose six stories and the staircase. Uh, I defined my, my uniaxial material, the ones that I needed. For example, here, I want to see the monotonic behavior of my concrete. Yeah, you see here, so the basic default um, setups of the, the material tester does not suit all the tests that you want to do. For example, in this case, uh, my concrete ultimate strain, strain is, much, is a bit higher than the one here. So if I want to see the actual behavior, if it, well, yes. Wait, sorry. I will have to 
go a bit further to see what, what is happening or even further. Exactly. So this is my concrete uniaxon material. Then I have my steel material. Here, there's a cyclic test that I did last when I opened this, but if I want to do a monotonic one and see my behavior, let's go a bit further. Yeah, I will see my isotropic strain hardening. And then I created the fiber sections with the rectangular fiber section. In the property tab, you can visualize the sections that you created. I have here my column with rebars. Just remember, if you're modeling in Newton meters, like in this example for me, uh, you have to put everything in meters. So in a rectangular fiber section, even if you do not have, for example, left or right rebars, the diameter has any way to be inputted and has to be in meters. You will receive an error otherwise, and you will not be able to visualize your section applied in the model. And the same goes for stirrups. So for example, I did not put any stirrups here just for simplicity of the comparison with, um, with open seas. But the same, if you have stirrups, you have to input the value in meters everywhere. Ah, just coming back a little bit, the concrete properties here. So given that I wanted to make a comparison between my Tico, this Tico, this is the geometry for last time, and this is the creation of the materials in open seas. And in Tico, I could do all of this calculation, no? But if I wanted to do the same calculations in STKO, how could I do? Uh, the best way is to use a Python script. So you develop your own Python script. Here we have a utility for you, you can reuse. I even put here some tools to, um, to use the, um, the same concept that we use in util zero for the unit conversions. And here you can define your properties of your structures, the ones that you already know, and the ones that are uh, derived from some that you defined before, and then apply it to your X objects. So as we said, each physical properties in STKO is an X object that has attributes, and the attributes are specific metadata values. All metadata are of different types. In this case, it was really easy because all of these values are numbers, and so we just have to call the quantity scalar type and its value to assign the value. This all was put in a little function because uh, if you have to create more than one concrete zero tool, you can just pass different, um, different parameters in the function and, and then create it in your structure. This is what's comment out, I don't know why, just for maybe I was using it to do something else, yeah. So I'm, I'm going here in my subject one and I apply all of my all of my parameters inside, the ones that I defined before. And when I run the script, it will assign them to my Uniax and material concrete. I didn't do the same for the steel because yeah, here I had to do a conversion, but this I did by hand in this case. It was not so difficult, but I advise you to use the, the to use the Python script and to use convert, unit conversion calculations because they can really help you out not to make mistakes. Like if you, if you normally just approach some units in a certain way, like using only MPAs or using only meters or using only American imperial systems, that so you can really make mistakes if you don't use this kind of stuff. After defining my two fiber section, I had to define a uh, beam section properties to reference the fiber section and apply the integration scheme to my elements. And then this one was the one that I applied in the structure. Um, a first beam column element was chosen to be applied to all of the elements. So here we have a distributed plasticity model for my little concrete frame structure. The base is fixed. The master node are fixed in their plane. The rigid diaphragm is applied to the interaction created before. And everything is like the last model that we saw. And we have an, uh, a distributed load on all of the beams. So the same is in open seas. As you saw, we created the uniaxial material with all of the parameters required. And then this is actually the script to create the fiber sections. As you can see, it's a bit more complicated than, let's say, not so straightforward as the one in STCO through the rectangular fiber sectioning subject. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, these are the, exactly the same fibers created for that. Uh, I can show you here. So as I said, to create the patch, we have to define the corner nodes. And to create the layer, we have to define the first and the last uh, location of our layer. Be careful with like the orientation because uh, it can get tricky. Then we have to define the geometric transformation. As, as I said to you last time, if you use these parameters for your geometric transformation of column and beams, you will apply the same local axis default orientation of STKO. So when you run your model and you save your MPCO recorder, you will be able to, to make a comparison of the parameters of the results. So here we go. We can load, this is my STKO model. And this is my OpenSeas model. If I, if I load a different surface plot here, yeah, and I change the source database, you see here I have two exact models with the same displacement. And the same is for, for example, fiber plots. Here I have a fiber plot of my open seas results, and this is of my SDK result. If I take this away, yeah, I can see both things in the same and visualize my fibers, for example, only on my reinforcement. Yeah, let me zoom, yeah, better. Here, as you can see, the results in the scales are exactly the same. And I can apply the same visualizations to With, yeah, to my OpenSeas model. So this is a really useful tool if you want to just use it in the post-processing phase to compare your OpenSeas, um, let's say to visualize the results of your OpenSeas modeling. So I think that's it for my example. I can give you more information on the example itself if you want, mm, but is there, if there are any questions, we can start with the questions. There's a lot of faces today. Hi, Paolo. Hi, Enrique. Hi, Antonio. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Was, I was a super presenter, so there was no questions. It was, everything was super clear. Have you guys already modeled something in OpenSeas? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> because uh, I haven't modeled anything uh, with 3D frame structures yet. So when you say like, in this case, you model the beams with the with the um, fiber section, like the pro like the physical property was a fiber section, and you define the material and the material of the stirrups and the and the um, rivers and everything. Yes. And this is your cross section, and you put it in the physical properties at the same time as with the material. Yes. Okay. So let's say I put I create the material and then I reference the material in my section property. So like I, first I create the material. For example, you see if I create this material afterwards, I cannot reference it in my section. You see that it changed color. Okay. Now I cannot reference anymore. So I have to create my material first, and, and then, then assign it to. Yeah, of course, because if I move it, it does not gonna reference it again. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, for example, inside here, I reference the tag of the material that I created beforehand. Okay, so inside inside this uh, inside the rectangular fiber section, yeah, I can I can select the material I want to use. Okay, and so here is if instead of uh, of um, using concrete, I want to do, for example, um, masonry. That is my case with like, I, know, like I can I do a rectangular fiber section for masonry? 
like for a macro model or something. You can do that, but you should just either like if it's reinforced masonry, you have reverse, then you can model those. Yeah, otherwise, you can just uh, put zero in the number of reverse so that you have only uh, the surface material, which would be similar to a concrete, but with the material properties of your masonry. So it is perfectly the same. I'll ask you to, to use at least one rebar at the corner of your section, but you can use a very small one. To you can just... use either a very small one or create a uniaxial elastic material with a zero stiffness in such a way that even if the fiber is there, it will not generate any stress. So this is what, what I was trying to say before when I said you can use the, elasti the elastic material actually, to actually apply for, a specific yeah, stiffness. But for um, masonry, rectangular section is much easier to create a standard fiber section instead yeah. of the rectangular one because you don't have to create anything but a simple rectangular surface so you can use the simple fiber section you go into the editor you create a rectangular uh, shape okay then you create a surface and then you can mesh that's all Okay, so I, I can do it this directly with fiber, with yeah. the type fiber, and so I don't have to think about any river stirrups or anything, and I yeah. just give it the, the properties of the material I designed, and that's yeah. it. We, we decided to create the rectangular cross-section just because creating every time a rectangular cross-section with rivers, it's very cumbersome to do it with, uh, with this kind of widget, and it is much easier to do it with the rectangular cross-section. But in your case, since you don't have any rebar, you can use the standard fiber section editor because you just need to draw a rectangle. So it's, it's easy. Oh, okay. And section, you can also it from your geometry, like from your render view. But actually, for, for rectangular, you can, you can also import it from the elastic section. So yeah. If you want to import width and height. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you have a lot of choices. Like if here you define a section. No, no, you, you don't need you don't need to uh, create it. You can just go into the fiber editor. No, it's cool, Larissa. You make me yeah, for example, discover stuff. You go in fiber <laughs> and here, then you go import. Yeah. Then instead from oh, Java, you can say elastic cool. section and you draw your section. Yeah. So like for example, okay. if that wants to do, for example, steel cross section, you can steel profile from here, and then you can mesh it, for example. So let's let's do the rectangular section you were before. Um, yeah. And then you mesh. It's already a face. It's yeah. already a face. Okay. So that's yeah, it's much easier. You can directly mesh. And here you can, of course, if you want three bars inside, you can anyway. You can draw them, yeah. Yeah. But if you have three bars, it's easier to use the rectangular yeah. cross section. Okay, so if if I want to make um if I want to make a model uh, I like um, a macro model with the of a masonry because I'm now want to do some um, equivalent frame models with yeah. some some um, masonry facades yeah. and so I wanted to do it with the with sticky up that's why I'm asking if this if this is possible with doing this kind of fiber uh, section. You can do it then if you want to do equivalent frame model you also need to include probably shear behavior so you can look i don't know if you already explained how to use the section aggregator yeah it's here okay so for you since you're modeling walls they have a lot of shear deformability so including shear deformation is mandatory and actually another thing that you may need is to create the rigid panel zone uh, at the cross section, uh, uh, at the cross of the, the joints. walls, yeah, the joints. And you can use the tool that we have for joints, mm -hmm. but instead of using uh, a, a material for the joint behavior, you can just specify a very stiff material. In this way, it will just create a panel, a panel zone. For example, the RC joint here, instead of choosing a material that breaks, which is can, uh, calibrated on reinforced concrete into column joints. You can create a very stiff elastic material. A very stiff elastic material so that the joint will not break, but then you can use the element reinforced concrete beam column joint to specify the offsets. Where, 
you put it before. So yes, doing equivalent frame model is much easier. To do it. Then you copy here. And also X and Y both, otherwise it can be, yeah. Then here to assign this, you just select a node. And you drag and drop it. And then you need to create the element, go to the element property, because actually that is what you really need to create the offsets. RC would be with this up. No, no. no uh, it is in special purpose. Yes. No, oh. RC beam column element. No, it's not here. Joints, mm -hmm. joints somewhere. Joint RC beam column joints at the top. Yeah. Okay. And then here you can specify the offsets in X, Y, and Z. In this way, you can easily create the rigid panel zone. I would see it, no? Not here, but when you... Ah, in the result. Yeah, when you, when you run it. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is, if I create, for example, the pier and the spandrel, the joint of these two um, elements, I do this. I generate, yeah. I generate a very stiff elastic material, and, I, and I, then I apply to this, this uh, element RC joint. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly, line. exactly. And, and you give it the dimension of your joint. Yeah. And I will give it the dimension, like this rigid panel thing. Okay. Exactly. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. So, so you don't have to actually define the spandrel and the, and the peer dimension as you calculate them by hand. No? Like you have your facade, they say, I want to divide this like this. The spandrel will be just the whole height, and then what will give it the offset is the joint material. Yeah, the joint material will give you an offset. So in the joint material, you have to specify the length in X, for example, which is the width of the wall, mm -hmm. and then the length in Z, which would be the height of the span. Mm -hmm. You can and play so this, this will overlap with the pier and the spandrel, and it, it will like work over. Yeah, it's, the it's, it's exactly idea. like putting an, an offset to your element. I have a, a presentation of the of STKO, the, the first ones. I can show you how it's, you see here, for example, there this yeah. is done in a concrete frame structure. So, like, we didn't really assign a different length to, to this beam. It's just the joint that kind of cut out the beam of the offset yeah, that we when applied. The CPO, when the CPO uh, tries to write the T code pi, it sees that you used a, a column joint. So, it takes the node of the beams and the columns and moves them away of a certain amount, which is the um, the, uh, the joint dimensions that you specified into the joint elements. And then the central node is connected to the beam and to the columns with rigid links. And basically, this one will generate the rigid panel zone between the wall and the spandrel. You can play with it. You can do a simple portal frame and see how it works. Yeah, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, because I want to, I want to uh, calibrate it with the, with the finite element. And so I wanted to know how, how to do it. So yeah. I will I will try it now with this. Thank you very much. Well, we have a um, a class on this, but it's like in two months. So you should try before and see. <laughs> like on equivalent frame modeling of Marjorie. But um, yeah, first. Oh, we, have, we have some questions. Yes, there. we have. So first question. Last class, you mentioned the commands merge, union, and compound. Let's say when I model a soil body with multiple layers, is it necessary to use one of these commands? If yes, which command should I use to create correct boundaries between them? Okay, so um, if you generate many solids, okay, using, for example, the uh, cube, um, where is it, the cube command, then you need to use the merge because the union basically removes the face which is in common. What well, actually you need them, you need a face that cuts the two solids because you need to assign different materials. Okay. We have the so in your case, you have to use the merge. Did you already explain the difference between union? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so for example, if you if you do the union, okay, the face inside that separates the two bodies. Is gone, okay? Because this is the typical Boolean command for union, and this is not feasible for you because you want to assign different materials. So you need a face in the middle that separates the two layers. So in your case, you have to use the merge command. 
because otherwise this would be one single solid and these are yeah. set to keep the division between the two, but they are connected. So your structure is not similar. Um, uh, then who wrote this? Uh, we don't. Um, yes, but yeah, you need, yeah, this is Polaris. Of course, when you use fiber, you have to pay attention to the drift limits. Um, I'm working then. on self-centering materials such as SMA. I think that it is already implemented. And actually, there is a PhD student here that implemented a new uh, shape memory alloy material that also allows you to, Luca Ceto, that mm -hmm. also allows you to specify a different uh, stiffness. So if you, if you go on the uniaxial materials, um, it is under material uniaxial. Then you have that one as the software. And then ASD SMA 3K, which is basically the same as in OpenSys, but allows you to assign an, ex, uh, an extra stiffness parameter. Okay. So, for example, I don't know if you have documentation here, but not. Otherwise, there is the standard one. Let me remember what is the, the name, materials. In the access, should be self centering. Self centering. Go down there. Uh -huh. It should be this one. And it is the same as the other one, but uh, just with two stiffnesses. So going to the yeah, going to the documentation. Go down. So if I don't know if there is, yeah, it's this one. If it is this one, what you're looking for? This was from Alfada. Yeah. Alfanda. Yes. Anyway, you can do it. We already have implemented this one or our own version that allows you to have a different stiffness for the unloading part. Okay, let's go down. That's, that's it. We don't have this is for Larissa to ask Luca about the paper. Oh, yeah, Luca Pelagius. Um, so, so, yes, you can do it. Uh, the SMA stuff here. Let's see if we have other questions. Do you guys have more questions? Hi, Francisca and Massimo. Dr. Massimo. Hi, Kaisal. Uh, I have a question. I think uh, the joint offset is already done. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, insertion point in uh, frame. So is it possible to have insertion point in frame? Like um, if we have a shell, it, it's done in SAP 2000. So like if we have a shell, so the connectivity of the shell to the rectangular cross section is done from the top center point of the um, of the beam to the center point of the shell. So is there such feature? Yeah, I mean, you want to connect a shell with a beam. I, I don't understand yes. what, what you really want to achieve. For example, you have a column and you want to model a part of a column with a shell and the other part with the beam with a fiber cross section. I'm talking about uh, beam under the shell and uh, the cross section of beam i want the cross section of beam to be at the bottom of the shell oh, okay so you just need to use yeah you just need to use the offset it's talking about the offset uh, for yeah. example let me yes uh, yeah okay so let, let me let me try to do a simple model of this one um can i create a new one no okay so imagine that you have a slab here this is meters, okay. I'm just trying to invent something here. Okay, so here you assign your shell and shell property. Now, for example, let's say here you want to assign a, a beam section. Let's go here and create an elastic section. Um, let me make it like the eye, and then I go in meters, and then I choose someone big enough like this one okay now let, let me use it as it is of course i don't need material now i just need to show you the the, the shape i select uh, one of the borders here for example let's say here i want a beam so i simply drag and drop this one and now as you can see they are aligned in the middle this is the default behavior but if you want an offset so you want to align the beam with the shell you can go inside the section the height is 700 and well, it's not exactly it's this one, 
divided by two. So calculator, you have 0 0.779 divided by two, which is this number. And then you go into the offset and you say that the offset of your beam is plus this number. So 0. Well, actually it should be minus. So you put minus here. Uh, where is it? Minus. And your beam is aligned. Okay. So this is one way. The other way is to actually draw a beam detached from the shell. You move it down and then you link them with a rigid link. But in this way, it's much easier. Okay. Wasn't there a whole concept of uh, if it's if the offset is large, then this kind of application of the offset it is not realistic? No, no, I mean, it is realistic. The problem is that if there is a real connection between them, it is realistic. If it is not, if there is not a, a perfect adherence, so you have some slip, some shear mm -hmm. deformability, which is relative between them, then you need to use some kind of connection. But if you can guarantee that they are perfectly attached, you can use the offset. Is it clear? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a quick uh, second question um, uh, because today is about uh, physical properties. So uh, let's say for masonry material, uh, the one which you have developed for those, uh, uh, what, which properties uh, should we enter? Like uh, what uh, experiments I need to perform uh, so that I can enter those properties uh, here for masonry? Uh, you're talking about this one, the pinching. Uh, what material? The, okay, this one or the one which you have developed uh, in AS, STK uh, or the special uh, material. Damage TC 3D. Is it the one for micro modeling, the continuum damage? Yes, yes, yes. This one as well as that one, micro modeling material. Yeah. Um, so actually, well, there are a lot of. Um, a lot of tests you can do, but actually you can you can look at my paper. I did a paper on micro modeling, and there I explained um, all the material properties of this material. At the time, it was not implemented in Open Seas, but um, it was implemented in other software. But the material properties are the same. I don't know if we have a reference here. Otherwise, I can. Yeah. This one. No, it's not no. this one. Okay. Then I will go, I don't know, this one is not you, uh, this one. Yeah, uh, actually it's not, this This one is fine, but there is another one that compares actually from, from micro modeling, which is, go down, should be this one, micro scale continuous and discrete numerical models. Here actually compared the micro modeling using the damage TC3D, with the interface model and I explain how to calibrate different material properties. Okay, so but basically you need um, some test for the tensile response of uh, mortar joints. Okay, so in terms of um, tensile strength and fracture energy. Same thing for compression, and then there is a parameter that is used to calibrate the latency of the material, and also in that paper I explained how to what test you need to calibrate that parameter, okay? So you can read that paper. There is a free PDF on ResearchGate, okay? There's another question about the beam offset here. Is it, does it matter offsetting the beam? Are you then for visualizing it? Um, the beam is a, is a line element anyway. Yes, this is, this is true, but actually the behavior changes because, because now, the properties of the beam are not related to the centroid, but to the top of the beam. So yes, there is a difference also in the result, okay? This actually will give you the same result as if you take the beam, you move it down and you link them with a, with a rigid link. Uh, on, you only have to pay attention to one thing because if you visualize the beam forces, so actual force bending moments, they are always related to the center line of the beam. So in this case, the center line is on top, okay? In this case, the center line is not in the middle, it's on top. And imagine you have a simple support, simply supported beam, you don't have any actual forces. 
But if you look at the result of this one, you will notice a small actual force because actually a zero actual force is in the middle. But if you have an offset, you will see a small actual force here, okay? So yes, in, the, in reading the result, using the, off, or the offset is like cumbersome. So sometimes people prefer to detach the beam, move it down and link it with a, uh, with a rigid lean. So it's up to you. I mean, if you just need results in terms of global displacement, that's fine. If you want to read the beam forces and deformation, then you have to pay attention that you are reading them not in the middle of the beam, but on top, okay? Is it clear? The rest, I don't know the name. Yes. Is that there anymore? Or maybe yes. Well, do you guys have other questions? Um, sorry, if no one has another question, can can you explain uh, what you were about to explain about the material pinching? Yeah. How you define the properties? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you use them for shear, uh, you have to remember that. Well, first of all, I think you explained them. What is the abscissa and what is the ordinate of this graph? Yeah, well, I explained that there is uh, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, she already explained that any uniaxial material can represent Different any combination things. of stress strain, force strain, or force deformation. Now, in your case, if you want to use it for your equivalent frame model, it will be force versus shear deformation. So um, the shear deformation is computed by the, by the beam. Then you need to understand how to compute the other parameters. Uh, you have to find some equations. There are some equations in literature that can give you the, um, the total shear strength of a wall and also the capacity. And if they are given in terms of force versus drift or force versus displacement, you can take the force points as they are, okay? But pay attention to the displacement because in that case, you need to take them and divide them, divide them by the height of your wall. Because in open seas, he expects shear deformation, okay? As the abscissa parameter. And the abscissa, yes. Here, like loads. Because many times deformation. these loads are given by force versus uh, drift or force versus displacement. Yeah, you have to find in any case some, some equation in your national code that tells you how to, to obtain these equivalent properties for the entire wall. Okay, because this is not a material property actually, is the shear response of the entire wall. Okay. Well, other than this, the pinching material can be used for any other thing. So the only thing that you need for a pinching material is the four points for the backbone curve and then the parameters for defining the pinching. I think you already explained them. No, I did not, but no. let's say. So the first, the, the four points are one, two, three, and four. Yeah, pinching can allow you to give at most four points, so, okay? So typically what I do is the first point is the cracking, then the second point is the yell strength. Then you have a third point if you want to specify a small hardening. And then the last point can be the residual stress, okay? From that point on, it will be a plateau, okay? Yeah. So you can represent this mainly, the, these main points of your backbone curve. And of course, you define their coordinates like yeah. in terms so of load. By and default, they are the same in tension and compression. If you click on the optional flag, you can specify the same four points in compression if you want to make an unsymmetric behavior. Okay. Let's just show them. Yeah, for example, let's try to replicate the values that you had here. So let's say two is the value for the first cracking. Then you have 12, which is the L strength. Uh, we had like um, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, 0 0.05. Okay, now if, if you do a monotonic test and you push it up to four, yeah, you will see that you have these four points. So the first one is the cracking, then you have the uh, the yield strength, the capacity of your wall, then you have the 
the ultimate strength if you have some hardening and then a plateau, a residual strength. Um, this is fine for monotonic loading, but then if you have to perform cycles, you need to define the, the other three values, air disp, air force, and new force. Which are like- Yeah, that basically define the shape, yeah, the shape of the pinching behavior, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, typically we put, let, let's go back there. We put the air, U force P to zero, because I want to start reloading from the zero stress. And then this one can be yeah, something like 0, 0.6 of the maximum displacement and 0, 0.3 of the maximum force. It's like in percentage. Yeah. And now you can do a cycle test, like symmetric linear increasing. You can do 10 cycles of 100 steps. Yeah. And this is the shape. Now, for example, if you increase the air force P, you will see that the corner point of the, of the pinching goes up. Okay. If you put them, for example, equal 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it should be almost a straight line, probably. It really depends on some other, yeah, almost, but it depends on the shape of the curve. So you can play with it and you can go from, from a pinching yeah, to a um, peak oriented. Okay, so you can do a lot of things. And then if you want, you can specify a non-symmetric behavior. So you can click on optional and you, here you input the negative values of the same. Yeah, I think they should be negative. So put, for example, minus two, it's fine. No, I put two. I think they should be negative, should but be I'm not sure. Ah, they should be not automatically negative, okay. I'm not sure, actually, we have to test it, so. Not all of them should be negative, probably. Ooh. If it doesn't work, they should be positive. Yeah. Minus, uh, I'm making it more non-symmetric, they're almost equal. Uh, okay, minus I don't know. Minus, uh, minus, 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 minus 10 minus one is fine. One. And the deformation put them pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same. So okay. minus 0 0.01, minus zero, I don't remember, minus three, yeah. minus 3.5. And then you have to also to change the earth values for the negative part because mm -hmm. you, you can change them also. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5 in this case. Okay, so you can also make non-symmetric responses. So you can play with them, but actually this kind of unique material can represent a lot of things. So you can use them from moment rotation to shear, shear deformation. And then you can also include a cyclic degradation. It's not something that, yeah, there are a lot of parameters to test, but you can look on the, um, on the manual there. But actually, you can also include some kind of cyclic degree. Let's see if there are some images. So just to know. No, no, there is no image for that. Okay. No. But actually, something that is more complicated to calibrate. So I, I don't think it is necessary now. Yeah. Is this fine? Okay. Uh, one thing more here uh, it is written stress and strain. For masonry wall, uh, for global action, we usually take load and deformation. And so, this is just the, 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 like the default that it's in the material tester, but you know what is it that you're inputting. Here is like stress and uh, load and deformation. So the yeah, material is actually, showing you. Yeah, here we just inputted some random numbers. Uh, because as we told you, the values that you put there really depends on where you're using this kind of material. So for example, if you use them in a beam, um, in a section force deformation, then you need to add forces on the y-axis and shear deformation on the x-axis. If you use them in a zero length instead, you need to use relative displacement, not deformation. So the values that you put there really depends on where you are using this material, okay? So in this case, they are just random numbers. Of course, they do not make any, any physical meaning, okay? No, but it's just also what's written here in the material tester. Oh, it's they, not, yeah, uh, actually, that's what it was. Yes, yeah, this is one of the problems. We always write stress and strain, but it was just a choice that we made because actually we, we cannot foresee what you will use that material for, okay? So for me, it is a material, so by default, I assume that it is stress and strain, but don't worry, you are, uh, you are the one that knows if it is a stress, a force, or a moment or anything else, okay? Of course, we don't have any way to understand what is your usage, okay? 
So don't don't care about what is written on the on the graph. Okay. So for masonry, uh, it will be I have a masonry wallet, and I am uh, applying monotonic loading on that. For it, it will be a global uh, load and deformation. Yeah, it, it really depends. For example, imagine that you want to model the entire wall with a single spring, okay? Imagine you're doing a very simplified model and you want to model the entire wall with a spring. Well, in that case, it should be global force. So the total shear force of your wall versus the top wall deformation, okay? So the total displacement. If you use them instead inside a section aggregator, inside a beam, then in the abscissa, you should have the shear deformation. So as a first approximation, you can take the total horizontal displacement of the, of the beam divided by the height if the beam is very shear deformable. Otherwise, you need to compute the shear deformation and uncouple them from the um, deflectional deformation. Okay, so it really depends. This is the point. OpenSeas allows you to define uniaxial materials. Uniaxial materials is just a graph, okay? X versus Y. What you have to put there depends on you. Okay, so in this case, for example, it should be the shear stress times the shear area to have the global shear force. I know it is quite confusing, but this is the way Uniaxial material are used in open seas. They have multiple purposes. So then there's a question. Experimental calibration and literature is a good start. Yeah. This is from Widow. Uh, yeah, but this is for, for uh, Larissa. It's yeah. for Larissa, yes. Uh, so CNR 2212, it's, uh, uh, yes, yes, it's, it's an Italian code. It's an Italian code, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, we do explain. It provides a lot of interesting literature. So we are a little bit. <laughs> we were behind, yeah. yeah. So this is maybe a bit out of scope for now, but I wonder if you guys are planning on an advanced course regarding soil structure interaction for a bridge structure. I've yeah. watched your files on interaction tutorial and also on the bridge tutorial without SSI. I would be much would be appreciated if you could see an example of the whole model for a linear um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, probably we, we, we can consider it. We can consider it. Yeah. There's a lot of contact issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, it can be we can actually the next, well, the, the next webinar. The of the 24th of June will be tomorrow. on the embedded, well, actually tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. It will be on the embedded constraint that we added to OpenSeas. The next one will be on a new contact element that we added to OpenSeas that is a contact element that is always convergent. So we actually can do the next one. Okay. So, so after we introduce this new contact element, we can apply that to a real life uh, bridge soil interaction problem. So Zan, there's going to be one in a couple of months. Yeah. And here's the link to the code for everybody. If you haven't seen the chat for the Italian code with Masonry literature references. Yeah, people are happy about it. Yeah, then. of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, yeah, we can do it after we present this new element because, as you said, if you start putting contact elements everywhere, you will have a lot of convergence problem. But this new contact element uh, is always convergent. Then I will explain you in the next webinar what I mean for always convergent. But yeah. So, if anyone else has any more questions. I can drag and drop the files from today, right now in the chat, if you want to see it right away, and then they will be uploaded on our website by tomorrow. Uh, Sorry. I you wanna go first? No, 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 go, 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 go. Okay. Uh, so good morning here, uh, TJ. Uh, a question uh, regarding uh, concrete elements in, in, in we've been uh, looking at masonry, but also uh, a column, concrete column design. Yeah. And been noticing that you guys have uh, a, a very robust uh, software that you have developed 
in, in conjunction with uh, with open seas but one of my questions is is regarding a, a can you do a report to have uh, like an in interaction diagram from from concrete columns well actually uh, this is a preview of what is going to be added in the next version we don't have it here but actually uh, we are developing now uh, a tool for testing the cross section as we do for example for the for the materials and that will give you the both the two dimensional and three dimensional interaction diagram and actually it will allow you to um to use a like a, a lump plasticity beam okay a lump plasticity um hinge but with coupling so the <clears throat> moment and actual force will be coupled I don't probably on my computer have a preview video from Diego, but yeah, no, actually it is going to be added very soon. We are working on it. Okay, so it's uh, you're going to be expecting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And it is actually in the testing phase, so it is already coded. We are waiting for all the tests to be passed. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a specific date or? Well, uh, actually, I'm not a specific date, but it should be on the next version. So probably like one month or two, but after, for sure after the summer. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Larissa, you had another question. Yes, sorry. It is not much to ask. Can you explain how the aggregator work? If I will, so if I, you can do a small example, it is not much trouble. How it works in open seas or how you create it how how you create how you implement it in your in your because in these cases if you have an only actual an only actual material but you want to add another property if i understood correctly so let's say that you have a beam in which you define the material that describes its actual axial behavior and you want to add uh, a shear behavior to the same material. So I have already another section. Let's say this one that describes the, the actual behavior of my material. I just click on here and I add another material that I, I'm supposed to have created before, of course, that can describe the um, behavior of my section in shear. So Actually, creating it is very simple. Okay, so before, for example, Francesca used a fiber cross section inside the beam property. Sorry, we are only seeing the, the presentation. Are oh, you not uh, sharing yet? Vanessa. Sorry. That was with all the things. So, this is the aggregate that I was showing before. So, for example, imagine now you want to use um, the same fiber cross section that you used before but also with shear deformation, okay? So you, you want to make um, a Timoshenko beam. You can, you can create a section aggregator like this. You specify that you already have a fiber cross section because by default, go down by default it's like this. By default, uh, a section aggregator has six degrees of freedom, okay? So it expects one uniaxial material for each one of them. So the behavior in compression, the behavior in bending in two directions, the behavior in shear in the direction and one behavior in torsion. You don't have to put all of them. You can use only some of them. Now, by default, we use a fiber cross section for the PMM interaction. So you can say, okay, for the PMM, I want to use a fiber cross section and you specify the fiber cross section. Then at this point, you can add both or just one of the two shears and optionally torsion. Actually, torsion is not necessary because it is already included into the fiber cross section. Mm -hmm. So typically I use it for including shear. Now you have to pay attention here because now you need um, to define a uniaxial material for shear where the, uh, in the X direction, you have the shear deformation, okay? So strain. In the Y direction, you don't have the tau, so not the shear stress, but you have the shear stress times the shear area, which is for the rectangular cross section five over six, the total area, okay? So you define a pinching or any other material, even a linear elastic, if you would just want to include shear deformation. Okay, let's define a linear. You can define any kind of linear material you want. 
Now, for example, if, let's say you want to treat shear in elastic behavior. Here in the shear modulus, you don't have to put the here in E, the actually, modulus. which is the tangent. You don't have to put the shear modulus, but the shear modulus times mm -hmm. the cross-section area times five over six, because that is the reduced uh, shear area, shear area, yeah. So I should have to go look yeah, at put my a area. Number there yeah. and it's not important, just one number. Yeah. I imagine that this one is uh, G modulus times area times five over six. G area. Okay. As then you go into the section aggregator and you put the elastic stress, elastic shear here. If you want to use it in a nonlinear fashion, you do the same, but you define a nonlinear uh, behavior. And then you still go in your beam section property, and instead of picking the section directly the fiber, you, you pick the aggregator that already here. contains the fiber cross section plus the shear behavior. I don't know how to move. Okay. 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 Why can I mute it? Uh, I should, no, you can click directly on the okay. on the mute. Okay, it's fine now. Okay. Um, so Larissa, is it clear how to use the section aggregator? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. And then we have something about the video. I have been, been expecting the reaction diagram as well. No, before some, yeah, I hope. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure, so I said after some. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. I Why are you trying to remove? Because he speaks. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, I can't, I don't know why I cannot mute people anymore. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I think because um, Guido accessed it and now he's the host. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Guido, you have to mute him. Yeah. <laughs> you have the right to mute him. I'm not the host anymore. I don't know. Okay. Is there any, any other question? Okay, hello. I have a question. Hello. I'm sorry from English. Uh, I am going to start my investigation using Sticky Yo. Uh, I, I want to model uh, um, a building of uh, 100 meters of height. So um, I need a recommendation about the uh, because I, I want to model a dual system. So for the shear wall. How to how to you um what's your recommendation for for this model uh, uh, yeah. uh, regard uh, in uh, for the model of shear wall yeah hey, are you talking about the reinforced concrete and, and, and so, so, sorry yeah sorry okay. one, one, one more question um, in, in brackets um, I have the the license for a student uh, it's in, in limited. For, for for research, researching. Yeah, I mean, the, the research license has no limits. I mean, the only limit is that you can use for okay. research, not for real life job, but it has no limit okay. in terms of the number of nodes or elements that you can use. That is the free, la the free version. So without any license, after one month, you have a limitation in the number of things that you can do, but the research license can allow, can allow you to do whatever you want. Um, oh, thanks don't have problems of model size. Now you said that you want to make a very tall building. So it really depends on the computational power that you have because um, we gave a webinar on how to model um, reinforced concrete shear walls using shell elements and rebars. The problem is that it really depends on how large is your model, how many shear walls you have because it requires a quite fine mesh. And so probably you need a quite good uh, computer to do that computation. Okay, so if you have a 100 meter tall building with many shear walls, be prepared to use parallel computing. So 
Perfect. Do, do you have already some numbers? How many elements you have in there? Uh, not really. No. Um, yeah, but assuming um, that you have... I, 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 I don't know. So uh, I, I will play with my tutor of thesis. So um, this, 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 the next weekend, the next week, sorry, um, I, I'll start with the model. So I think that the, for next Wednesday, I, I have the, that number. So uh, actually, uh, in the meantime, you can look at the webinar that we gave for reinforced concrete shear walls. So in that case, you can understand how to model a single shear wall with shells and how to put reinforcement inside the shell element, okay? And then you can have an idea of how long it takes to run just one single shear wall. And you can also kind of, you can also try to understand what is the mesh size that you need, because then when you will be doing a very tall building, you can also use a coarser mesh, okay? But it, it is something that you can do on a laptop with eight processors and let's say 16 gigabyte of RAMs at least. Okay. Okay. Because I imagine you, you're going to have something like 100,000 elements, something like that. So. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Well. There is also Colobaris macro elements. Oh, there is also that, that element, yes. Should we show? Yes, actually, or one the element. So you can use many. Many alternatives. That is the uh, if you want to model shear walls in details, you can use the shell plus reinforcement. Otherwise, you can use macro models here. What? You can use my... what? The translation sometimes. What did you say? You can use my grandma's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the transcript is not so accurate. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> So we're almost out of time. Uh, any more questions? Poor grandma says. Yeah, yeah <laughs> poor grandma. If you want to use it to model a 100 meter tall building, she's going to suffer. So just let's. <laughs> okay. Let's just meet up again next week. If you have any more questions, you can post them on the forum. Um, thanks to you, Faisal, for participating. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Meet you next Wednesday. Thank you, guys, all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larissa, for your questions. Thanks. Enjoy your day, evening, whatever, and see you next week. Bye.